That's right. Men of the North. That's what we're talking about today. What if I told you there was a game that had seven kingdoms and the men of the North were pretty important to that game? You'd say, wait a minute. Is there a muster phase? Is there a phase in which the wildlings attack? No, there's not, because we're not talking about Game of Thrones here. And I'm not even bringing up the comparison so you think, wait a minute, Brian, are you going to be comparing this to Game of Thrones? Because I'm not. The only reason I bring this up is because the game is called Saga of the Northmen. I'm not really sure how to spell that that quickly, but this marker's dry. By Minion Games. Minion Games is a company that produces some great games that fly under the radar sometimes, including this one. This one, as I'll tell you, passes the BRT, and I won't tell you what the BRT is until the end of this video because it's very important because unfortunately it happens way too often. I want to go ahead and tell you right now, I like this game. It is an area control game. Let's look at what this game is about, find out if you should play Saga of the Northmen and what all of the Northmen saga-ness entails. Who are the Northmen? Who watches the Northmen? Who North is the Northmen? That's fine. So compact, but intense, right? I mean, check it out. You've got a whole map of Europe here set in the Middle Ages during the Saga of the Northmen. I'm not exactly sure when that is. It gives you a history lesson on the front. It tells you about these brutal warriors and all that kind of stuff. And what's going on here? This is a game that is area control in two phases. So basically, here's the basic setup here. This player and that player, they both start with six cards. They both start with two trade route cards. This is the play deck up here. You can draw from here later on during the game, or you can draw these face up ones, a la Ticket to Ride. You say, wait a minute, you mentioned Ticket to Ride and not a fighting game. That's right, because as Viking-y as this looks on the front, this is a very much Euro game. It's a very much area control game. It reminds me a little bit of Tammany Hall or uh, Game of Thrones with a little bit of the 504 slash Power Grid stock stuff in there. You say, how does it remind you of stock stuff? Well, here's the thing. Yes, you are playing as a color, but these countries are the ones who do the actions. And that's, it's basic area control and all of it. But here's the thing about this. What I love is that this time track of movement. So this game's way deeper than it first looks just on the table. It looks like you're just pushing some cubes around and playing some cards, but it's deep. There's a lot of strategy here, especially with timing and movement and all those sort of things and trade routes. You've got to balance a lot of things. I had not heard a lot about this game, um, but I'm excited about it now that I've played it. I really liked it. Like, I, I liked it more than I thought I was going to like it. I thought I was going to, okay, it's kind of cool. It's area control. I really like this game. Like, it's it's up there, you know. And, and Carla, my wife, she was a little bit cold, cooler on it. She doesn't like area control as much. But let's look at kind of how it plays. And I'll tell you all about the stuff, you know, what we do like about it, what we don't like about it, things, you know, that maybe you will love about it that I love about it as well. So right now, here's how the game plays. So here's the game set up, right? The first player will get in a two-player game. We'll get three infamy tokens. The other player will get six. The way this works is on your turn, pardon the hero there. On your turn, you're gonna play cards out of your hand of cards. These are different types of cards. There are ship cards, fleets, right? And there are soldier cards. Really good graphic design because you'll notice on the ship card worth one, there's one ship. On the soldier card worth two, there's two soldiers and continue on with that. See, oh look, there's a good example, the Magyar. Little dude's hanging out in the background, and then boom, he's gone, just like that. Interesting thing about this, you'll play a card, and you'll instantly draw back up to six. When you play a card, for instance, this one on the Saxons, you would take one of your influence cubes, not from the card, those are infamy, those are spent for things, we'll tell you about in a minute. You take one of the influence cubes, because it's a one, place it on Saxon, you'll then Keep track of what you play in your play area face up. You'll then stack subsequent cards face up on top of it. You then notice at the bottom of this, it says Livonia, not in a three player or not in a four player game. We're playing a two player game. Anytime there's a thing on the bottom here, you'll put a plunder token. P.S. These are victory points. Right out here, that's how you win the game is by getting victory points. Either you play, you draw back up, so you'll take a card, draw back up to six. Oh, we got Norwegians this time. The other person will go, they'll continue putting stuff out until this happens. Now, all 15 of the plunder tokens have been placed. There are 15 for each round, 45 plunder tokens in all, 44 now because I've lost one of my tokens, unfortunately, somewhere. But anyway, that's when the first part of the round ends is the planning phase. By doing that, you're going to continue playing cards, continue putting plunder out until this happens. Now, you do the movement phase. First, you check for control. So down here in Byzantines, the green team controls this. This will go on to the infamy card, not the general supply. And that's important. You'll see why in a minute. 
Blue owns Russ, green owns the Danes. Here we have a combat struggle, uh, a struggle for power, and then over here, uh, blue and green are obvious winners. Now look, the way this works is this is three on three, right? Because heroes count as fighters as well. But the way ties are broken is the person with the most heroes wins a tie. So right now, green would go. Had this just been three on three cubes, the person who is holding the first player token that round will win it, the fight. Now we're in the movement phase. Movement phase works like this. You'll work back through the cards that you played and you'll see, for instance, the blue person played a Norwegian card. They just have one here, but normally you always have, because of what you played, you always have showing in your cards what's reflected on the board. Therefore, you can move, let's say you had a ship card too, and I'll explain what the ship cards do differently. So let's just say this is a Norwegian ship card. It's not, but I'll cover it up like that so it looks like it is, okay? So let's say you have two things up there. That means that one of those is a fleet and one of those is a ship. We won't worry about the hero for now. Let's pretend he's not even there so I can simplify this. Let's just say you had two cubes there and this is what you had played during your turn, one and one. That means that you can move a soldier marching units to one adjacent neutral area. Neutral areas are the ones without colors and with plunder on them. Then you can move your ship one. See, you can move the same amount of the card number that you play. You can move your ship any space that has an adjacent C to it. So Holy Roman Empire and Poland are landlocked. You cannot move into those spaces with a ship. But for instance, this ship could go down here to Africa, just like that. You'll continue moving until everyone's just kind of moved out to where they want to be. Uh, let's, obviously you had a ship to get there and they know that the cards are built for that. Have fights, fights are settled the same exact way. Here's how the movement works though. It's not just willy nilly. People don't just take the turns whenever they want to. There's a track up here that tracks when people move. And I love this mechanic. So you may be the Normans, right? You may have, uh, you may have controlled the Norman area. You may have asked them to help you and gain their reputation and influence. Well, they go first, they move first. So for instance, if the Danes and the Normans both had their sights set on the Holy Roman Empire, the Normans are gonna move first. So if the Danes know they can't beat them, let's just say they had a hero involved or another cube in there. The Danes know they can't beat them. Well, now they can move elsewhere. They don't have to go there. They can go into Livonia and try to beat them there. They don't have to go in there. But because the Normans went first, they don't know that that's the case, which is what brings this time token in. One of the infamy things, and I'll explain the rest, is that you can play a time token. If you spend five infamy to place a time token, let's say you play it on the Normans. Well, now the Normans move last. They don't move first anymore. So now that person who is banking on the Normans moving first as the Danes has to go, well, crud, I hope they, maybe they'll move in the Roman Empire, maybe they'll move into Cordoba down here. They don't know anymore. So there's a lot of strategy with timing and I love that. I think that's a great thing. That is the movement phase. Once the movement phase is done and everyone's kind of in their area, battles are fought the same way as control. These are collected. These are the plunder tokens. They're also the victory points and you score. The way that these other cards work that I mentioned earlier, these trade route cards, it's kind of like Ticket to Ride in that sense that you score based on completing these trade routes. So for instance, if in the phase you had controlled Russia and now you have also controlled or have troops in Cordoba, there's the trade route. You would score this worth three points. If you control Byzantines and then you also have won the plunder here in Poland, you would score the five points on there. So it's basically a trade route in which you control the main area at the beginning of the round. And then once the movement phase is done, if you also control the bottom area, you then score the trade route. It stays there. It's worth five points or three points or whatever it is. That is how trade route works. Third and final phase is the planning phase. You can do a few things. You can spin, by the way, infamy card, uh, infamy points here. Let me explain these to first of all, save a card. So for one infamy card, at the end of this, you're gonna have a hand of six cards no matter what, right? But unless you spend some infamy, they're all gonna be discarded. Everything's gonna be started over the deck and six cards are gonna be dealt out to each player. The second thing you can do is you can draw three more and these are a little bit dated. They say the wrong things, you know, chieftain objective. That's not the call that in the game. Understandable, no quibble. Uh, you draw two trade route cards, right? And you get to keep one. That's the rule on it. So it's. These are the way you really score points anyway, the trade routes and trying to get those done. Clear all the influence, clear everything else, set up the plunder tokens, 15 new plunder tokens come out. These will obviously be off the board because you'll have taken them in your score and then you start a new round. This happens three times. In-game scoring is how much plunder. 
Ties are broken by unused infamy points. Um, you also get infamy points back here. There's one other final scoring thing. Infamy points, all players now compare their unused infamy points. The player with the most infamy points receives the bonus plunder equal to one plus the number of trade routes completed. So that's an infamy bonus at the end of the game. But that's how the game plays. Saga of the Northmen, final thoughts. Here we go. I like this game. It's double area control. Two area controls happen in one round. Happens three times, three phases times three, nine different phases in this game. The game is done. It plays very quick. So if you like Game of Thrones, it's got that aspect in it. If you like, you know, other games, that involve area control and ticket to ride style card placement. I love that. This game is awesome. It's a great game. The theme is cool. You know, it's this middle age and uh, middle ages kind of fighting stuff. It has a lot of Vikings on front. I don't know. You know, it's not so much about the Vikings. The Norwegians are only up here, but I guess they're just kind of showing these warring clans and all that sort of stuff. Now, the natural question that's going to get asked is, does it pass the BRT? And say, what's the BRT? The BRT is the blood rage test. Because there's a Viking on the front, everyone's gonna go, wow, why would I need this game when I have blood rage? No one does that with trains, by the way. No one does that with Cthulhu. Well, why do I need this game by Fantasy Flight when I have Munchkin Cthulhu, right? Nobody does that, but here's the thing. Blood Rage is so popular that everything with a Viking on it at all is going to get compared to that. They're not the same type of game at all. These are way different games. This is a very much Euro style area control game and it shouldn't be compared. It's not the same kind of game. So I just want to stress that, you know, in case you're thinking, well, I'll just play Blood Rage then. You can and you should. You should play Blood Rage too, but this is not something you would throw out to keep Blood Rage and vice versa. This is a different style of game. This is a very Euro game. In fact, the theme turned my wife off a little bit until she played it, and she seemed to like it a little bit more once she played it. Um, she doesn't like area control anyway, though. So if you don't like area control, obviously it's not a game for you. This is double area control, but the timing is what makes it so unique. I love this timing track and these manipulating the timing track with the hourglass tokens. Well, so, for instance, if you play your hourglass token and somebody goes, well, heck, I've got to have mine timed after him. They then play their hourglass token and it plays in order after that. So there's so much time manipulation. There's all these cards and things you can play uh, and just really try to race to win the most plunder points at the end, but there's multiple ways to do that. You can go trade routes. You can go by getting the most just straight off the board, you know, building your armies up. It's a really good game. It's a really balanced game, and I think you should check it out. It's not getting enough credit, but it really is good. Like, it's small, too. You notice that? Many games are good about that. This is only a two-fold board. They're good about putting out small games with a big feel. This is the opposite of uh, kind of chain reaction, if you saw my review on that, where it's that fun size version. This is a big game in a small box, and I really like it. I mean, if you played Game of Thrones, you know how big that box is. This is kind of like that same feel. You know, it doesn't have the supply and all that sort of stuff, the extra political things, but it has just enough great mechanics with a cool theme and really good art, you know, and thoughtful art too. The fact that there's only two soldiers on this one because it's a two card and there's only one soldier on this one, I think that's great, you know, smart choices. So make sure you check out Minion Games, Saga of the Northmen. It's a really good game. It's worth playing if you like area control, if you like Ticket to Ride. Heck, this is the next game version for Ticket to Ride, so make sure to check that out. If you haven't seen what we're doing, check out what we're doing at The Latest Retro on Twitter, BrianDrakeShow.com for the magic stuff. Um, until next time, we'll see you here on the Dice Tower. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.